Hi, everyone. This is Justin Gray from Immersive Mastering. This is episode six of a series of videos that I'm making dedicated to Dolby Atmos music production. This is part two of two videos that I'm making specifically discussing mastering workflows and aesthetics within the format. Uh, before I move on, I really want to thank everybody who's been reaching out to discuss the format, commenting on the videos, asking questions, um, and those who have reached out and we've started working on music together. Uh, that really is the point, is to share and to you know create pathways where, where we can get your music out there in the Dolby Atmos format at the highest possible level. Um, I look forward in the future to letting everybody know some of that music and getting you, you know, to get to hear some of the music that I've worked on. Some of it's not online quite yet, and I'm obviously not able to play it in these videos because when I'm not the content owner, YouTube would take down the, the video, but looking forward to doing that. If you'd like, please do subscribe to the channel, stay in touch, and uh, you'll get a you know chance to get connected to any future videos I make on this topic or just music production in general. And if you get a chance, please do visit www.immersivemastering.com. I'd love if you could just you know check out the music uh, and some of the artists that I've had the chance to work with, and I look forward to hearing from you. So, mastering part two. Just before I move on, I want a reminder of what a mastering, uh, critical mastering setup for Dolby Atmos uh, is, and that's a 714 playback system. This is the specs of my own particular room, which is tuned to the Dolby spec um, for home entertainment and, and music. And I covered this in detail last video, so I won't go into it again, but I did, Apple, I did add, um, in the sonic averaging department, I added the idea that, that an iPhone with iOS 14 or above and an Apple TV 4K plus an Atmos receiver to me are part of the requirements for really being able to sonic do proper sonic averaging for all of the considerations surrounding the Dolby Atmos ecosystem. In the last video, I did discuss quite in detail where mixing and mastering meet and how in this format we have to be seeing you know, this that they're very much intertwined. But these videos are specifically dedicated towards um, encouraging the idea of, of maintaining that mix to master workflow, um, especially for people who are going to be working specifically in headphones only um, or people with, uh, you know, not fully spec'd out uh, Atmos multi-channel environments. So I'm not going to go into this again, but I was discussing the idea of multi-channel object-based stem mastering, uh, and I would encourage you to, to, again, watch that video if you haven't already. So, mastering aesthetics. Over the past month, especially since the announcement of Spatial Audio with Apple, um, I have been working day in and day out in the format, and I just wanted to share a few aesthetic concepts that have come up in my own work uh, and discussions with some wonderful engineers from around the world. The first is around upmixing, or what I'm calling remixing or, or respatialization. In the last video, I referred to the term upmixing uh, in relation to taking a stereo file, for instance, a, a hard, you know, hard LR stereo file, and using a tool like the Nugent Upmixer to actually expand that file into a 5.1, a 7.1, or a 7.1.2 uh, in Pro Tools, for instance. Um, when I use the term upmix, that's what I'm personally referring to. I have heard it used uh, in relation to describing any time that a stereo production, even when stemmed out, is turned into a, a, an Atmos mix. At the end of the day, I mean, it doesn't, as long as we know what we're talking about, it doesn't really matter. But to me personally, I don't think of when I'm being provided stems, I'm doing a lot of work um, with a specific label right now, as well as a lot of independent artists. When I'm given those stems, I don't see it as an upmix. I see it as a maybe as a remix or just as a respatialization of that mix. Um, I don't see it so much of, of an upmix, but in the, in the sense that I'm, I'm given all the parts uh, and, you know, with critical deliveries, I've been working with, with artists and working with, you know, the great materials that labels provide um, and getting a lot of, lot of detail and a lot of control to be able to re-spatialize. So I think that calling it upmixing 
it's just important to discern that it's not just, you know, using a Nugent plugin to throw it around the room and call it a day. Um, now, at the same time, there have been, I think, some very critical discussions around the idea of the aesthetics of taking a production that was made for stereo, that was already mixed and mastered and put into the world possibly years ago, and then re-spatializing it, remixing it. The first thing I'm going to say is that when we're going to be working on new music from the ground up, that's, a, that's amazing, and that's where this format is going, and that's what this format needs. That said, for these re-spatialized mixes, as I'm referring to them, I think it is absolutely essential that we ask for the master, not just a mix uh, stem, but the master, and we compare to the master, and we honor that master. Now, what does that mean? As a mastering engineer, I'm used to getting a mix, going through my analog chain, and constantly, very quickly and efficiently checking against the original mix to make sure that the decisions I'm making are serving the music, that they are musical, that they are helping the overall impact to be more desirable in whatever way that means. Sometimes it means nothing in, master, in, in stereo mastering. Sometimes it means a lot. But regardless, we always have to remember that you know, when a master has been put out into the world, in my opinion, it is essential that I pull that master into my Atmos session, even if it's just stereo, and I constantly go back and I remind myself, okay, this is already a piece of art. This is a piece of art that a producer, artists, or, or multiple producers, engineers, um, you know, label executives, the whole ecosystem have signed off on, who believe in, who, who listeners have already developed a relationship with. So I'm pulling that master in and I'm constantly checking, making sure that I'm reminded, making sure that I know that piece of art before I start changing it. This is essential. I also think that it's really helpful to get the anyone who's a part of the original team involved. Let's share. Let's educate. Let's not look to just do something because it's different. Let's do something because it, it offers a new and inspiring and, and musical outcome. And so I just want to just put it out there that, that you know, those of us who will be doing that, especially when the piece of music has already been finalized and put into the world, let's remind ourselves that there's that stereo is is you know still the peak of the mountain for the 20th and 21st century of music production, and therefore, or at least it's certainly is you know the most common and and most uh, popular. So therefore. There's a lot to be said for going back, checking, constantly making sure that we're honoring that music, as well as doing things that, in my opinion, are very exciting, very musical, and offer a new and inspiring perspective on that same piece of art. Um, so to come to the purpose of Atmos, what's the purpose? The purpose is that re-spatialization. And, and what I will say is that every single artist who has come to this studio had a chance to hear their mix or their master re-spatialized from all the stems, every single time has been a similar experience of, and I've personally had that experience as well, of being absolutely awestruck by the sonic experience, by having the music surrounding you, by having the music be with you. And I'm not talking necessarily about things flying around, and yes, that can work too. Um, but even in stereo, we've done lots of panning things for years. So it's like sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not. What I'm talking about is just the sonic experience of having that music around you. Um, it is actually more represent representational of how we experience sound in the world. We don't experience sound in the world discreetly from two sources. We experience sound all around us. So I think that it's actually uh, putting us into a sense of realism when used properly. So just to say that... Th that why? Why Atmos? I think it's a very important question to continue asking ourselves. It's not always going to be the thing to be done, but in every single production that, that I've come across, I do think that there's a way that Atmos can serve the music in a, in a, in a way that is absolutely justifiable and inspiring. Um, 
So I'm going to probably continue on some of those philosophies as we go, but it's just a you know, personal discussion and personal things that I've been asking myself as, as a mix master engineer in this format. Why? What's the, what's the point? Where am I going with this? Which are the same questions we need to ask ourselves when we're mastering stereo music or discrete channel, multi-channel music. So um, moving forward, mastering aesthetics, headphones, sonic averaging. It is essential. The majority of people are going to hear this as a binaural fold down or as an Apple spatial audio binaural fold down. And therefore, it, we have to be considering that experience. It is it, the peak of the mountain, is no doubt. It's the 714, um, or you know, possibly 916 if you have you know um, access to that. But the, the headphones can't be ignored here, and they're very meaningful. And they again can create a really fantastic experience if done properly. So you know, in my situation you saw me wearing these uh in my early videos those of you who know the odyssey lcd 4s know how heavy they are <laughs> know that for longer youtube videos it's easier to wear a slightly lighter pair of cans but having a pair of critical or multiple pairs of critical headphones is is a part of this process um, similar to how in mastering we might have multiple pairs of speakers for um, sonic averaging. In this case, that's not the case because these have to be specifically placed in one place, tuned properly. There's not really an easy way to do sonic averaging, at least in my space, for a 714 array. But for headphones, there is. Um, so that brings me again to the binaural render mode. We've got to be, we've got to be using it. We've got to be thinking about it. We've got to be checking our loudness on it. And we cannot be clipping it. We can't. Um, when this music goes to the title, that binaural render is representational of the, um, of the immersive stereo file and the, what, AC4 IMS file. It's, it's, uh, we cannot be clipping that, that binaural render. And that comes into the discussion of loudness big time here, which I'll, I might touch upon now or I might touch upon a little bit later. Checking on Apple systems. I've got a bunch of ways of checking on my Apple devices. That's because spatial audio is Apple's own proprietary decoding algorithm um, or decoding software for taking a DDP GOC file and spatializing it. And therefore, we have to check that tuning. And unfortunately, it's not a fold down in the monitoring section um, or the binaural section of the Dolby Atmos renderer. Will Apple ever do that? Will Dolby ever do that? I hope so. If if they, you know, it, it makes sense. It would it would be lovely to have the ability to have the spatialized binaural be a real time algorithm that we, we could access. But in the meantime, uh, we have to check on Apple systems because that's you know at least fifty percent, if not more of where this music's gonna be listened to. And loudness, coming to loudness. A lot of my friends, a lot of colleagues um, have commented on really enjoying some Atmos, also questioning it, justifiably so. Gotta remember something here. This is not the same as stereo. It is not intended to be the same as stereo, and therefore we can compare it with stereo because it's a, it can be experienced in a, in a stereo set of cans, so for sure, binaural is a stereo format. But I think it's important at this stage with this format that we recognize what it is. In its main um, macro format, this is a multi-channel speaker-based file or, or playback uh, production uh, technology. And so in 714 is where this exists. And that's why, even for those who might be working in headphones the whole time, which I'll talk about in another slide, and I, and I promote um, as, a, as a production technique, it eventually does have to be finalized in a space that's properly tuned with mastering grade equipment, just like all music benefits from. And as a result, we have to remember that, like, for instance, we all know there's some killing masters out there that are like minus eight, minus seven, minus six LUFS. I mean, that's loud. 
that doesn't have to be that loud. I'm all for dynamic range, but I'm just saying we all know that they exist. If you were to play back something at minus eight or, you know, minus eight LUFS in a 714 and sit here, it would be, it would be painful. It would be so overwhelming. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that someone can't try it. You can try whatever you want, but just to say as a standard for loudness in when you're when you have 11 speakers plus LFE 12 speakers you know putting that sound towards you it's just way too much it's not the point and so you know this this sort of target this well-known target of minus 18 LUFS it is a it is a glorious and beautiful and well thought out dynamic range for this format and speakers where the where the loudness comparison starts to come into play is in Apple Music. And it's actually been on Tidal for a while as well. But And the consideration here is that we only deliver one file. When I author, I author into the mass, you know, into the Dolby rendering suite, and then I author my, you know, and, and upload my ADMB um, WF file. And that's the master. That then gets turned into a DDP JOC by Dolby. Um, also, AC4 IMS gets, which is the binaural render, gets sent to Tidal. But for Apple, they only take the DDP JOC, and therefore there's only one file. And therefore, it has to be designed for 714. And the binaural is created from that DDP JOC. And therefore, there's no way, even though the binaural could be way louder, it's possible, um, there's no way for that single file to do both without making the 714 like just slamming in loudness, which would be inappropriate in most cases. I'm not going to say anything's wrong. There's no, no point. Anyone should be able to try whatever they find musical, right? But as, as a whole, um, I think those of you who experience it will will find this to be generally true. And so the key here and the big challenge, and my challenge as a mastering engineer, continues to be, just like in stereo music, loudness is one of the challenges. But in, in Atmos, it's only just, it's, it's less so of a priority as much as in stereo. But those of you who have tried it will have experienced that the... Atmos files that you play back on Apple Music into your cans, your headphones, sometimes are quieter in relative playback volume than the original stereo version. This is something that's, I mean, personally, I don't, I don't really personally care as a consumer. I, you know, I just turn up the volume till I'm happy. I turn down the volume till I'm happy. It's it's pretty simple. This might be this might be a pretty a crucial moment to just let the loudness wars go and remind everybody about the volume knob. That being said, for the perfectly ironed out experience, I understand the challenge. The challenge is because that binaural render can come in at like, I don't know, let's say minus 14 LUFS would mean you really did some pretty tricky mastering tricks in the in the master which which I have done and especially for some of the pop stuff I'm, I'm not saying that I'm ignoring it I'm definitely taking loudness into consideration but to achieve like minus 14 with a still healthy 714 is in the range of what's happening and so as we all know minus 14 is actually a is a glorious dynamic range for a lot of stereo masters uh, it's been argued to be you know, maybe the most appropriate uh, centralized target for stereo music. That doesn't mean that most people are doing it. I mean, if you just peruse the available stereo content, a lot of it is crossing that threshold and going significantly louder. So we have a discrepancy here. The issue is, the last thing I'd like to see is Apple Music now normalizing the binaural to bring it up and integrating their own limiting process to now limit the binaural it's it's not going to work it's a bad idea um, the binaural is is more fragile than the stereo the psychoacoustic stuff needs the dynamic range to breathe it needs it so it's just something that we need to keep in mind that you know this isn't 
a, a, a typical stereo workflow, and there are technical things that need to be considered. Now, I have a suggestion that I'll make at the end of the video, just, eh, just some things I'm going to throw it into the ether and see what happens with them. There is a way, I think, there is a way that we could mitigate this a little bit and, and still focus most, most importantly, any decision, any technical decision should be about music. It should be about, it should be about making the most musical decision. How does this music translate the best? So, um, and loudness does play a role in that. I'm not saying it doesn't. So anyways, just some technical considerations I've been having. Lots of things that keep me awake at night past the hour where I'm already working late. Uh, and it's it's fun. I look forward to people's thoughts on this. This is how we this is how we move forward. Okay, Atmos mixing in binaural. This is um, I don't know if this is a popular take or not, but I've talked to quite a few engineers who you know had that moment of oh my goodness, what's spatial audio? What's Atmos? Oh my goodness, I gotta I gotta go get how many speakers? I gotta get ten more speakers. This is a, this is insane, and the reality is that. In my opinion, if you want to be working on Atmos Music and you don't have the ability to go all the way with your monitoring chain, I'm talking conversion, I'm talking full range speakers, I'm talking speaker placement, I'm talking tuning, timing, the whole, the whole deal. I would personally, from my own experience, uh, if I was in that position, I would choose a pair of headphones, the best pair of headphones that you could get and a beautiful amp. I use the uh, SPL Phonitor 2 with these LCD4s. It's a beautiful, beautiful match. Um, I would choose binaural render mode, an excellent set of headphones, like, and, and a good amp over a mediocre or untreated, um, a mediocre 714 system or playback room. Because the reality is, it's already hard enough. We all know this. We, we already know that, like, for instance, a mastering facility like this, I've had to treat it a very specific way. And, and not, not just me. I mean, so many of the, the world, you know, our awesome community of mastering engineers. We have, to, we have to treat our rooms, our systems, with a very specific attention to certain details to guarantee transparency for, for the ability to have translation. And so... But mix engineers, there are lots of mix engineers who work in variable scenarios that, that don't need that at all. And, and they prioritize, instead of prioritizing speaker placement, they prioritize where their keyboards are, their synths are, their instruments are, where their preamps are. And yeah, of course, when the music's being made, music, 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 music is first, second, third, fourth, fifth, like everything else. So, so again, it's, a, it's an argument to be made for this is where the mastering process is essential in this workflow. Just because it's stem-based mastering doesn't mean that there's not room for someone to work in binaural mode the whole time in their session. It's still flying everything around. The binaural mode with good cans, like I'm talking really good headphones, um, is quite convincing, and it does lead to decent translation. And then you pass that file on, and then it gets finalized. Finalized in the 714, and the sonic averaging begins. That's uh, personally, I would suggest not not making the decision to go the route of a mediocre seven one four, and rather treating this as a headphone based production workflow. Uh, if that helps financially, if that just helps to get the music happening, I'm actually making the argument that it would yield to better results um, because you can get a lot further with your budget with headphones and an amp than you can um, with speaker. We all know the math there. So just a consideration and something that I'll put out there that I would, I would vouch for, as long as you're you know, willing to get the music mastered, of course. So deliver for mastering. Um, I have talked about a bunch of things um, in the last video on this, so I won't repeat those. But I do want to, let me see, I think, yeah, I'm going to skip that and come back. I do want to talk about uh, part two of the prep delivery for Atmos Mastering because, because of a, a bunch of the people that, and artists uh, and, and the label that I'm working with, uh, I've learned a bunch of stuff over the last month. So first of all, Nuendo also has native Atmos support. Uh, just important to put that out there. 
uh, equal to Pro Tools, like in terms of native panning and, and all of those things. It looks quite beautiful. Logic, Ableton, and Reaper. These programs could use the Dolby Audio Bridge as the output device and the Dolby Atmos Renderer as the receiver, and therefore with the Dolby Panning plugin could create, could create an Atmos mix. It, they don't have 712 beds, which means that spatialized 712 reverbs and delays and, 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 and bed tracks are not yet possible, but I do know that Logic's got something on the way, and surely they'll, they'll all get there soon enough. So, we get into this thing. In the last video, I described, I described that the handoff of a Pro Tools file is the most ideal. Um, I would say, yes, that I'd still... Someone working in Pro Tools, why not? Why not just make it easy? Um, you know, commit the plugins that I don't have, although I <laughs> have most of them because it's, you know, sort of a responsibility and and I'm working in the format. As you know, I'm very dedicated to the format, so I'm, I'm right in there and, and trying to use it all. But regardless, opening up, I can just take the Pro Tools file and go from there. That being said, there was something that I missed. The ADM BWF file, which can be exported from the renderer, um, can be imported to, pro to my system, for instance, using session import data. It's amazing. You spit out whatever you made it with, Nuendo, Logic, Ableton, Reaper, however you got there, the ADM B-Wave is, is a part of a 4824 um, master file set export uh, you know, file potential. And then that file, I can session import data into Pro Tools. I get the bed track and I get all the objects. I lose the labeling of the objects and stereo connected objects become mono objects. But all everything keeps its original panning and it keeps its original objects, uh, what I refer to as alive. They're still individualized. It's basically like a really, really slick stem export workflow, way faster than having to export all of your stems. Um, of course, everything's baked in, but that's a good thing. So that means that it doesn't matter where you're coming from. There is a way, as long as you're working with the renderer, which you have to be to be making Atmos, um, or the master suite, of course. But just to put it out there, the ADM... BWF file uh, makes the makes the handoff even that much more flexible, which is which is awesome. Um, stereo and Atmos workflows. So I, I did describe this in the last video, but but I had a couple conversations recently, and and I'm designing a couple projects with a few people where I, I think that this is helpful for just again considering how this all works um, or can work. Start in Atmos. I've got a record where we started in Atmos. This is this is amazing. And I, I'm not going to say the artist's name yet, but I cannot wait for this record to be out in the world. And we'll, I know that uh, that artist and I have uh, uh, hopes of you know making some joint videos where we can go through and discuss just how that all came together. He's a, he's a brilliant composer and engineer, and it was it's really fun. Specific music designed for for 12 channels. So um, start in Atmos. We mixed it in Atmos. We're, we're uh, putting that into, on a streaming, of course. He's putting it out onto Pure Audio Blu-ray with uh, Stefan Bach in, in Munich um, from MSM Group. Pure Audio Blu-ray, as I said in previous videos, is the, is the pinnacle for this format. It is the high-res uh, gold standard for Atmos, and it's, and it's worth it. It's amazing. Um, It'll go to streaming, and we're also doing a supervised stereo fold down. So that means I take the Atmos file, I, I listen in stereo with the artist, of course. We're doing it all over audio movers. So he's watching my screen. We're doing it all together. And we're listening to the stereo re render in real time and adjusting the Atmos mix, including all the panning and all the little details, to make the stereo come alive. And I've got to say, it's turning out really well. We were both apprehensive. It was the first time we were doing it. There's a lot of potential there. The natural stereo fold down is is inspiringly good for what it is. The fact that we're taking 12 channels and turning it into two in a in a blink of an eye, it's beyond functional. I mean it's mu it's musically quite incredible. Dolby has just just continues to impress me uh, beyond beyond belief in this regard, but for a stereo release, because we're going to put this on vinyl, 
going to put it on separate as a stereo deliverable. I don't think it's going to CD, but it could. Then you can just do supervised folds. We're also doing a supervised 5.1 to go onto the Pure Audio Blu-ray. So the supervised concept means that we could just start in Atmos. We don't have to go the other way. The opposite, of course, start in stereo. This is the majority of projects, and I would encourage it to continue to be a workflow for anything, really. Um, do your stereo mix. Master it. Then go back, spit out all your stems, and re-spatialize. Um, one thing I will say is, I think in the last video I was suggesting all stems and effects are always separated. I don't know. I'm having a... I'm, I'm having a change of heart with that, especially with some of the label work that I'm doing, in the sense that when a vocal, for instance, and a vocal and a, and a reverb have been painstakingly designed, it's important that we keep that alive, probably. Not all the time. So again, I'm not saying any, nothing I'm saying is intended to be set in stone. I'm just trying to throw this out there to be considered, to be discussed. Uh, and, but I will say that the stems I've been getting, especially stereo stems with with baked in effects and and considerations, so that when I press play on this, you know, the stem playback in stereo, it sounds like the mix. Um, it's working for me. I think in different cases you might ask for different things, and sometimes maybe you you want to use a spatialized verb for something instead, and so therefore having the stereo or, or whatever the mono stem plus the effects is a separate stem it's more work for the mix engineers to spit it out but absolutely that's like probably the most ideal but i'm just going to put it out there that for certain things baking the effects in is also completely functional because then we can also still add to that when and if appropriate so okay just a few few ideas here on designing music for the format this is where we're going right like there's going to be a bunch of this respatialized work. We're all going to, um, any artist, and again, please reach out. Let's make it happen. Um, you're looking at an album saying, you know, I think this would sound great in Atmos. This would be a really nice re-release. Um, be nice to get some momentum and then build into the next record by putting out even an EP or a single or whatever it is. That's going to go on. But the really exciting thing is now that everyone's becoming aware of it, aware of the potential, is that more and more music will be designed from the ground up to support the format. One of the first and most natural ways to do that is working with engineers who understand, and I mean understand, how to use multi-channel mic arrays. This means, you know, there have been 5.1 mic arrays, like, you know, the Decatree, then we have the 5.1, the 7.1, and I have seen 7.4 mic arrays done beautifully, um, in Europe, there's quite a lot of classical work that is done this way, and I've heard that music put into it, you know, into the Atmos format, and it is nothing short of stunning. Um, I've described Pure Audio Blu-ray, for instance. There's a lot of music in that um, on various labels that use that format that that have this, and this is where you go back to the stereo and you realize, oh my goodness, I'm missing so much. Like when it's just the microphones being placed, essentially, probably just you know within reason, discrete channel placement of those microphones, it, it's it's closer to being in the space than I've ever experienced. It's, it's a hi-fi version of sitting in the best place in the room. Uh, it truly is something else. That being said, this could also be used for live music, where you've got a concert and then you've got audience. Um, sort of going back to like the concert for George, that beautiful 5-1 mix where they put some of the audience in, in, the, um, in the back for that 5-1. You know, with Atmos, we can really, I, just to say, I, I think that there's some cool potential there. And just individual instruments. Start miking instruments with this in mind. I'd love to see some interesting arrays over drum sets or over string quartets, not just over full orchestras, not just in huge rooms, but just giving the opportunity. And, and again, this is not, these are not my ideas. These are ideas that advanced engineers have had but now it's time to find those advanced engineers and enlist them, get them in the process, get them taking whatever you're recording and, and finding ways that we can very naturally use what was already being played to fill this format in, in, in what I think will be really inspiring ways. Um, another thing to consider, and there's actually one of them hanging on my 
on my ceiling here, I, I, I use it all the time, is a Soundfield or the Rode Ambisonic microphones. Uh, Rode bought Soundfield, and they made the Soundfield plugin, which will turn that um, B format, is it A format or B format? My bad, whichever one it is, um, that, that Ambisonic capture um, into a 714. So we can have one microphone that's doing uh, you know, a full 360 degree capture, and then it gets folded into a 714, which can then be put into discrete objects uh, discrete channel, either, well, you can't do a 714 as a bed, so in that case, you have to do it as objects. Unbelievable. Again, throw that over any instrument. See what happens, even for solo instruments. Why not? Don't only rely on these spatialized reverbs to do it. Use microphones to do it. Do it, you know, let's integrate these worlds together. The classical music doesn't need to be the only music that uses these techniques, and vice versa. So, I don't know, just throwing it out there in hopes that it gets some some gears uh, turning. And the last is arrangements considerations. I had someone come here, amazing artist, they've got a record out on now. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, personally work on it, but we did a demo here. And the first thing they said, beyond just being so into the sonic experience, was, wow, now that I know this, I, I, I would think about the fact that there's more room for background vocals, there's more room for a bigger choir, rather than feeling the necessity of squeezing it all in they wanted a nice, clean stereo uh, production. They felt like there was the space to do more, musically, of course. And more is not better. More is not better. It just There was the sense that there's room for a few more details that without it feeling crowded. And so I just want to throw it out there that that's something that can be uh, considered. So what do we got? We got two more. Thanks for, I mean, <laughs> at this point, I'm just throwing it all out there. I hope it's helpful. I look forward to your feedback. I look forward to connecting on it. Um, and, and I appreciate you checking it out. So future requests and considerations. This one, you know, I just think it's, if we don't ask, then they may not happen. Um, I discussed this earlier, earlier. Apple and Dolby, everybody could. It's not necessary if we just all remember the volume knob and its uh, power. But if Apple and Dolby can consider this, this loudness differential, there could be some way that it is mitigated without having to introduce normalization. One of the ways could be, although I will admit that I'm just throwing this out there and I might be wrong, is that if the binaural ray render in could be trimmed, it would mean that we would have more headroom to push the 714, if, if musical, of course, and therefore the binaural render could reach a louder LUFS and probably still work. The question is why. This is the big thing. I'm just saying it's. I think it might be possible, it might be worth considering if by chance this loudness differential is causing people to, to not experience it as much, which I think we should check the data and see if that actually happens first. But just to say, a trim on the binaural would allow us to push the 714 further with then not clipping the binaural. And therefore, if somehow in the DDP format and Apple would have to consider this on their own time with spatial audio, I, I recognize that this is not a, an easy thing. It's a lot easier to say things than to do them. Um, but this is a consideration, something that's been coming to mind. The other would be like the most epic option, which I understand that file sizes and streaming doesn't allow right now, but as a separate separate supervised mix bundle, like Pure Audio Blu-ray. Pure Audio Blu-ray, you've got your 714, you've got your 5.1, your 7.1, your 2.0. They're separate files that you select, like a DVD, you select you know which chapter you're going to take on a film. So... In that case, we could be doing supervised versions of everything and delivering a packet of like the perfect stereo mix and the, I mean, perfect, the bin the ID you know the the tailored binaural the tailored five one the tailored Atmos the tailored uh, etc whatever, um, well those are all of them, th that I would deliver. Um, th that's huge though. We're talking about like a six or seven gigabyte deliverable at that point, and so I recognize that that's overkill, but just whatever. Throwing it out there, the, the discussion of Atmos becoming a universal standard for music, 
um, is there. And I don't, I don't think that it's, I mean, that's yet to be seen, right? I do have a lot of faith in the format. I have a lot of faith in its flexibility, but to reach that standard, maybe this type of, um, growth process could be considered. I don't know. Future requests. Work with the artists and the original production team when possible. Let's build community. Let's share. Let's ma- the, the, I believe that all ships rise. The more that this format sounds awesome and engages listeners into what it is, the more it's going to be demanded. The longer the longevity for it, the bigger the ecosystem, the better it will get. Um, be musical. There's a lot of power. And, and musical is all aesthetics, right? I mean, all of this production, playing, writing, mixing, mastering, Atmos mastering, whatever, it's all aesthetics at the end of the day. We, sure, there's lots of technology involved. There's lots of gear. It's fun. <laughs> but it's all aesthetics. It's all decisions. They're artistic decisions. Be musical. But at the same time, I do think that everyone needs to allow for some boldness. We have stereo. We've pushed stereo. We like when it's pushed. We get excited when new things happen. Let some new things happen. Push. See what happens. Maybe some of it will be dated one day. Might happen. There are eras of music which could be argued, which it could be argued that there are some dated practices there, but it's a part of the progression. And with change, we need to push. We need to see what happens. So I look forward to seeing seeing those those boundaries getting just absolutely open wide. And yeah, we might have to pull back from them, but I encourage them. I encourage to see where that goes. And for the listeners, for the engineers, for the community who I've seen, you know, lots of up and down on this. Oh, it'll, you know, it's too much. Why is it necessary? Just all I would encourage is let's be patient. Stereo's been around a long time, and we still can't agree on a loudness uh, delivery <laughs> standard. So things take time. And so in this format, just just let it breathe. What I will say is, um, this is to the next one. Anybody who wants to find out what this is about, get yourself in a 714 critical listening environment with a good Atmos master and listen to it. That is when you see what it, why this hype. The headphones is, is an awesome part of the ecosystem. Binaural has its potential too. It's quite engaging, but, but I understand that we say, okay, well, stereo versus binaural, let's, which is better? Um, let's, I mean, I'll get to the next point in a second. Fine, we can discuss that, but when it comes to the 714, get yourself in that environment, experience it in what it's designed to be, and then understand that the beauty is here and the fact that it's not only here. It's in the 714, but then it's also in 5.1 or stereo or in binaural, and it, and it allows for access. So the scalability is just absolutely brilliant. I mean, heck, we have trouble sometimes getting stereo to work in mono. This, this system is working. It's inspiring. There's something huge happening here technologically. But let's be patient. Let's let it run its course. Let's let it perfect itself. There's a lot of moving pe- puzzles, a lot of moving pieces. And um, I think it's, you know, take a deep breath, dig into the music, keep enjoying it, see where it goes. And so that's my last one is eventually I'm hoping that this is not a, this is not designed to be a, an Atmos versus stereo thing. I get it. I get the way that, you know, Apple put it out is this is the future and, you know, Marvin Gaye, here was the original Marvin Gaye, and here's the new one. Well, I agree. Better is the wrong word to use there. It's different. It's a new experience. Let's just embrace it as that and find out when it can be musical, when it serves the music. So eventually I'm hoping that this is not about, ooh, is the stereo better or is the atmos better? What I want this to be about is making musical experiences. And, and when this serves the music, which I have found it does and I believe it does, you know, when appropriate, that's where it's at. Um, so last thing I'll, I'll put out there. Uh, this will be my longest video to date, but it's a lot of information. I hope it's, <laughs> again, I hope it's helpful. Apple, Tidal, and Amazon. Here are our three streaming platforms that support the format right now. 
very quickly in a nutshell. Apple put out spatial audio. Spatial audio is their own technology for decoding, currently, a DDP JOC. It works over ear, uh, any headphones, but automatically works with any of the Apple headphones. I got to say, the AirPods 2 and the, the AirPod Maxes are beautiful headphones. They really are. And the spatial audio really is tuned to them. It works with them. Um, now, the Atmos will also play back on computer playback. It'll also play back on your phone when you have your phone like sort of sideways and like a faux stereo uh, mode. And yeah, it sounds slightly bigger, but in all reality, that's more of a, it's amazing that it just works in the first place. It's amazing that we've taken a 714 and it'll play back on your iMac without being all phased out. Um, the same thing goes for the phone. Uh, for the for the experience, what this really is in, in terms of like the critical experience is the binaural fold. Now, the spatial audio codec that Apple made is making their own tuned binaural. It's not the same as the binaural coming from the renderer. It's different. I'm studying it hard. I'm uh, learning it about it every day. Um, I, I think it's quite musical. I think that if treated properly, it can sound amazing, just as amazing as the original binaural, but it's important to remember that it is its own. Uh, good news. The Apple TV 4K over Apple Music will spit out via Bitstream, which is HDMI, to uh, a full 714 mix. So I'm now that was already possible with Tidal, which I'll get to in a second, but it does it does work. So I've got that coming Apple TV 4K into a um, an Atmos enabled receiver by Yamaha, balanced outs into my Avid Matrix into my system. It's pretty epic, but it's uh, it's worth it, and it's a way that I can hear the content and and you know just be really up to date with what that content is, not just in headphones. Hearing as close as possible without getting the master files from from uh, the original engineers, hearing what's out there, but hearing it also in its seven one four, which is which is important, at least when considering the format at this level, in my opinion. Title, I remind us all that title has had Atmos for a long time. Uh, and and should be commended for it. Tidal is essentially now linked with Android, where Apple is linked with Apple. Surprise, surprise. As of right now, to my knowledge, by going with spatial audio, which meant that they didn't go with Dolby's tech, it also appears to have locked Tidal and Amazon out of playing the audio back on an iPhone. Let's not go any further on that, in the sense that I... You know, I don't know what the motivation is there. I don't know what the future is for it, but I hope to see that changed. Regardless of the situation, on an Android, uh, you've got this same behavior where you can plug in headphones and you get the AC4 IMS, which is the binaural render, or you can play it back and it works as its stereo. Um, and vice versa, sorry, not vice versa, additionally, Tidal HD um, will play back the Atmos file over the Apple TV 4K in the same way that the Apple uh, Music app will play it back. And I might be wrong, so if someone knows better, please do tell me. I think that they're playing the exact same thing. I think that they're both playing the DDP JOC. I see no deliverable where Tidal would have it at a higher quality in that regard. In the difference is on an Android phone, there, Android is using Dolby's tech, so you've got a, a Dolby tuning versus Apple's got their own tech. So in the headphone world, it's different. It's a different experience. But over Apple TV 4K, unless I've missed something, they're the same. And then Amazon HD, which has also had Atmos for a while, but only really to play it back on their own augmented listening 3D speakers like the Echo Studio. So long video, I know. I appreciate it. Um, look forward to your comments, look forward to your questions, look forward to hearing your music, look forward to creating this relationship. You know, I'm here to, to provide information specifically to artists, producers, and mix engineers who want to start working, who want to start going at this, and then reach out and, and let's master the music, let's make sure it gets into the, music, into the world at the highest possible standard. Let's give this format, let's give the music the, everything it deserves, and, and make sure that, you know, this, this is all about music. 
It's all about music. So thank you again. Subscribe to the channel. Keep in touch. And uh, www.immersivemastering.com if you want to check out some more music. Have a great day.